pilots are using AM radios, which are very susceptible to noise, to talk to the towers. They were hearing static on their in-flight communications, and it turned out it's from the Starlink. So how did in-flight internet work without Starlink, without interfering? There used to be two systems. One, there's the ground-based systems. T-Mobile has a service where they beam cellular up to the passing airplanes. And this worked pretty great over the continental United States, over Europe, where you're flying over the ground, there are towers, but as soon as you get over the ocean, there are no towers, no internet. And so that's what most of the U.S. domestic flights use these days. Then for over ocean, since there's no cell phone towers for that, they'll connect to geosynchronous satellites to get internet from there. Problem with this, I mean, it worked everywhere on Earth. You could go over the ocean and still reach the satellites, of course. But it's half a second to a second of latency. And the new, new thing starting to appear is Starlink internet service on airplanes. They required a lot of debugging. There was a lot of testing to make sure they were safe before they went live. And I know various things were adjusted. When 5G first rolled out, there actually was an issue with it interfering with the plane's altimeters. They bounce, they use, what, 4.7 gigahertz, and they bounce signal off the ground to make sure they're at the height they think they are. And they came to the conclusion that 5G, when it first came out, it was interfering with the plane's equipment. So for a little while, they enforced 50 miles around airports. 5G couldn't work. So how is Starlink different from those previous satellite providers? Well, the previous satellite providers are in geosynchronous orbit. So their satellites are 30,000 miles up. You kind of point your dish at them. It's high latency. About 120,000 miles of extra travel time, even at the speed of light, that turns out to be half a second. Now, Starlink's really different. Starlink's low Earth orbit satellites provide internet to the planes with pretty good latency and pretty good speed, whether over land or water. They're only a couple hundred miles up, and they actually have 6,000 satellites. So wherever you are, there's a satellite that's almost overhead. They're putting ground stations all over the place. Wherever there's a good internet connection, they're putting a series of weird balls with dishes inside them that they're setting up on fast internet connection. You beam up to the nearest satellite, beam right down to a place close to you, and you're right on the internet. Now, if you're over water, there are lasers between the satellites. So whatever satellite's above you uses a laser to reach out to another satellite that's hopefully over a ground station to get you down on the internet. So now you're starting to see the latency get a little worse. If you're in the middle of the ocean, it can end up having to travel thousands of miles to get to the nearest land, but it's still better than that giant two round trips of 30,000 miles. All the other systems only worked in the air, right? Until you took off and they turned off the fasten seatbelt sign. It didn't work, but now it's going to work the whole time you're on the plane. Right from when you board at the gate, it's already working. Hmm. You take off, it's working. You land when you're still on the tarmac, it's still working. So how much does being 35,000 feet in the air closer to the satellite affect the latency? Well, that was my first thought. So I whipped out the old calculator. And it turns out, not much at all. Even the low Earth orbit satellites are a couple hundred miles up. It takes a tenth of a millisecond off your latency being an extra six miles up in the air. It's nothing you could probably even measure. So does that mean no more airplane mode? You know, airplane mode has been kind of not what it used to be for quite a while. It used to be you turn on airplane mode, or turn off your Wi-Fi and your Bluetooth and your cellular. Now, it really only turns off your cellular. Everything else stays working. A long time ago, like in the 1980s, there were real dangers. Cell phones were more powerful. The electronics in the cockpit were not properly shielded. The GPSs actually could be interfered with by Wi-Fi and cellular devices on the airplane. But all of these standards have come up so far. This hasn't been an issue for probably 30 years. They carefully test phones' emissions to make sure they're at legal levels, and the legal levels are set to be safe. All the electronics in the cockpit are properly grounded. They have shields on them. They're tested against interference to make sure that bad things happening electronically don't interfere with them. This is part of the entertainment system, and it is entirely separated from the electronics and software that run the plane. So if it gets hacked, maybe they show you a funny movie that you don't want to see on the plane seat. So really, I believe, isn't any danger at all anymore. And I don't think there has been for 30 years. Things are really properly designed now. But once upon a time, they weren't. But you just said Starlink was interfering with the cockpit. Sure, but we don't know which part of the system. I doubt it's the Wi-Fi router they're putting inside the airplane. Because they've had Wi-Fi routers inside airplanes for years. With, you know, those other systems using the cellular and the geosynchronous satellite. People have been using laptops and phones 
that have Wi-Fi not turning off their Wi-Fi. Well, it is properly shielded for that. People have been testing for years. I'm much more suspicious of the actual satellite communications, that high power radio shooting off into space, although it's a much, much higher frequency, which makes you think that shouldn't interfere with a DHF radio. But for all we know, it could be the power supply. If the power supply isn't wired up quite right, it could be putting out noise, putting out the interference that they're picking up on the radios. You mentioned pilots have to use AM radios. Isn't that outdated technology at this point? In most fields, yes. But in air traffic control, they picked it as the technology they want to use, and they did it for good reason. The pilots, of course, use VHF radios to talk to air traffic control. So VHF is 30 to 300 megahertz. But pilots are only using what's called the air band inside that, which is 108 to 138 megahertz. Narrow little band where they use AM radios, amplitude modulated radios, to talk to air traffic control about what's going on. And it's not a mistake, and it's not an example of them being old-fashioned. They've purposely chosen AM radio as the best technology for air traffic control. Why? So AM radios have this interesting property that there's no error correction. If two people broadcast AM radio at the same time on the same frequency in amplitude modulation, what it hears on that frequency is what comes out of the radio. And so if two people transmit signals at the same time, both saying something, the signals mix sort of like sound waves do, but not exactly. And you get this signal where you hear both people talking at the same time. I'm not saying you can understand both. It's a jumbled mess. But you know, two people talked at the same time. I didn't get both signals. You can ask them to say it again. Almost every other system we have, OFDM, all the digital technologies, FM radio, which is frequency modulated, all of those have error correction. FM, one of the wonderful properties it has is that if two signals arrive at the same time on the same channel, you only hear one of them. One signal wins. The error correction makes sure you only get one message and make sure you never mix two messages. The weaker signal just disappears and you never even know what happened. And that's why, you know, if you're listening to FM radio in your car, there's much less static than there is an AM. AM, every little bit of interference gets played and you hear static and distortion. FM, you just hear what the main signal is. But that's dangerous with airplanes. If two people speak at the same time and their signals collide, you want to know what both of them said, even if you have to go back and ask both. Mm-hmm. If they were on FM, you'd only hear one plane and you wouldn't know that there was another plane who said something that they thought was important and you didn't hear a trace of it. So if it would be dangerous to use another technology. And that's why for the real-time communications, it's AM. What's in the air is what they hear. So if Mm. there's any interference, any random noise, or any data packets, if the Starlink was putting out any data in that frequency band, it'll get played as static that the pilots will hear. What can they do to fix it? Fixing these kind of radio interference problems is typically referred to as black magic, not engineering. There's kind of a lot going on. So when you get a a powerful transmitter, Starlink talking to satellites, it not only puts out the frequency it means to put out, it usually puts out a fair amount on half that frequency, quarter that frequency, eighth that frequency, sixteenth of the frequency. Also, if it's like sending packets at a regular speed, 10,000 packets a second, it is also now making a 10 kilohertz signal. Just those packets going out, even though each of the packets is on a much higher frequency up in the gigahertz, the set of packets together form a signal themselves that shows up. So this stuff can be really tricky and you, you have to look very closely. And a lot of times the solutions come down to just some conducting tape in the right spot so that there's one more layer of metal between the edge of the Starlink antenna and where the VHF antenna is. Maybe the power has to be turned down a little bit on the Starlink. Maybe they have to be moved a little further apart. There are kind of a lot of tricks that can be done. So you think Starlink internet on planes is still in our future? Absolutely. I think they're going to fix this up. I think there's a bunch of RF guys walking around with antennas and spectrum analyzers and they're going to figure this out. It wasn't totally jamming it. It was just adding a little bit of static that they could hear. They'll sort this out and Starlink will be providing internet on airplanes. So what does this mean for the satellite internet market? Well, the satellite internet market is exploding right now, right? Planes, trains, boats, ships, all this stuff that was never on the internet before is going on the internet all through satellites. I think at this moment, virtually all of it is going to Starlink. In fact, I suspect they are just stealing customers from the old systems with the high latency. But there's a lot more competitors coming. Amazon's finally gotten some satellites up for their Kuiper system. And they're saying over the next year and a half, they're going to get 3,000 satellites up. And they're going to have an internet service that's going to undercut Starlink on price. There's AST, which is talking about launching hundreds of satellites. And they're big satellites. They're more 
more than four times larger than the Kuiper or Starlink satellites, 4,000 pound satellites that will these vast solar panels. There's the thousand sales from China. I doubt that'll operate in the US, but I think in other countries, you'll see that. They're talking about putting up 14,000 satellites. There's OneWeb, Global Star. There's a lot of companies doing a lot of stuff in space. I think we're going to see a lot more bandwidth, a lot higher speeds, a lot cheaper prices. It's really an exciting time for satellites. Do you predict all the airlines are going to be adopting this low Earth orbit satellite internet? Yeah. And I think that, I think it makes a ton of sense. And I think that Starlink has a huge advantage, this first mover effect. Changing something like this on an airline, right? Getting permission to put a satellite antenna on the outside of the plane, to electrically connect this into the airplane systems, to do the RF inside the plane. It's a lot of testing. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot of proof that the system is safe. And they're all doing it now with Starlink. So when Amazon Kuiper comes and says, oh, we've got the same product, but it's 20% cheaper, it will not be worth the airline's effort to switch. Like switching from the old stuff, right? The ground-based had low latency, but didn't work over the ocean. And they need something that works over the ocean. The geosynchronous had a second of latency. And so it's worth switching Starlink to escape all those and have low latency everywhere on Earth. But just to cut the price an extra 20%, that is not worth the trouble of switching for these companies. It's so much work to evaluate and test a system that I think Starlink has what will turn into a fairly permanent advantage. The other guys have to be more than twice as good to steal away the customers once they've started with Starlink. But Starlink doesn't work in every country, does it? Right. And it's not a technology issue, really. It's, it's that they have to get permission. The countries, even though everyone shares space above, they own the radio waves in their country, so they can't be beaming down a radio signal to airplanes without permission. There are countries where they're still squabbling over frequencies and spectrum and how much they should pay. So this is, let's just say, some airline technology providers are using Speedify, actually, to combine multiple links. So you can use Starlink where it works. But when you're over ground, you can connect to cellular and kind of hide the whole thing from the people on the airplane. You know, and if Starlink doesn't work, if you still have the system, you can suck it up and switch over to the geosynchronous. So it's not as good, but Starlink's pretty good. We're seeing it work about 99% of the time, which for an airplane is probably good enough. For people trying to do real things with video, it's not, right? It's more than 30 seconds out of each hour that we're seeing it not work. But I think just add one more thing. If you're overland, connect down to the 4G. You can really get rock solid just by putting anything else together with the Starlink. It's almost great. How do they get enough bandwidth for 200 to 800 passengers? Yeah, those big Airbuses, they actually fit 800 people on a plane. And that is a lot of bandwidth. So there are systems that have multiple Starlink antennas to connect to multiple satellites. I have found that putting two Starlinks in the same area, you really can double your speed. As you start adding more, sometimes you don't quite, right? They'll end out with your additional dishes just connecting to the same satellites. But yeah, they can have multiple dishes. And this is another spot where having a system like Speedify helps, where you could also connect to the geosynchronous. It's a little more latency, but you can get some more bandwidth. There's a ground system. You can grab some cellular data as well to keep everyone online. Another important trick to not make the internet feel slow when lots of people get on, sounds counterintuitive is to rate limit each user. If you can't get more than 20 megabit at any time, you won't notice when a few more people join the Wi-Fi. If they let you use all the bandwidth when you're the first person on the plane. You'll say, my gosh, I'm getting 800 megabits. This is fantastic. And then as each person joins the Wi-Fi, you'll see it get slower and slower. It, it'll feel so slow and you'll be upset. But if they make sure that you never take more than a reasonable share in the first place, you won't notice as it gets slower. It'll just feel like that's how it works. So does this mean captive portals are going away? I'm afraid not. So captive portals, of course, when you join a website, that's that page you get where you have to agree. Like United is making you agree that you won't do video calls, that you will wear headphones when you're listening to music, that you will not watch inappropriate content on your screen during the flight. It's not a technical reason. They just want you to agree to these terms because they don't want people shouting into their phones during calls. So that's really what they're trying to avoid. So I guess you can still get away with not joining work meetings if you're on an airplane. Well, for now, you can't do work work calls in the airplane. Just wait till you get your neural link so that you can join the call straight from your brain to the Wi-Fi to the Starlink. It's a LinkedIn dream come true. The grind never stops. Hit that subscribe button for more satellite tech discussions like this one.